this morning. I can't stand myself. I mean, no, that's when it's good. There's a reason why I had to build my own pulpit, because if I'd have bought one somewhere, I'd have beat it to death. This one can take a licking and keep on taking, you know what I mean? God has been dealing with me this week about a kingdom paradigm of reality, because interwoven into the fabric of our Western society, we have been stripped of a true biblical understanding or a Hebraic mindset of our Western society. And guys, it leaves us at a great disadvantage. Now, I've been, over the last few weeks, as we've been dealing with being established in truth, uh, we have discovered that many of the foundational proponents or agents of the age of reason said, basically, if you can't see it, if you can't observe it, it's not real. At the same time as they were selling that to the general public, they were all occultists in the background, whether it be the Thule Society, which enabled Adolf Hitler, or whether it be things like the Rosa Christians or the Freemasons. And so they're selling us all this, all this goods of stripping away the spirit realm while telling us everything is of the soul and everything is of the flesh. And the church has even bought it. Now, I, I, I am a big proponent of what is called nuthetic counseling, J. Adams and many of those. I mean, how many know that biblical truth prevails over everything? And when you quit doing the Word, you start having problems, and you, the only way out of your problems is start doing the Word, which is a part of what nuthetic counseling is. you got to be confronted with your lack of publicity in your life and called back to repentance to do what you're supposed to do. But I had odds with Jay Adams as I was reading through it because his Presbyterian roots, they said there's no spirit, man is just made up of soul and body. You, you can see how that has permeated everything. And we're told there's no place for God in, in the public square. There's no place for God in education. There's no place for God in all these things. What we don't realize is we have been duped because the very ones that sell that to us don't believe it. It places us at a disenfranchise, uh, it disenfranchises us from the power that we need. God told me this. He said, when we move from a Greco-Roman mindset to a Hebraic one and beginning putting the miss, missing pieces back into place, our disadvantage, their advantage disappears and a kingdom paradigm falls into place that empowers the people of God. Because right now some stuff ain't working. Can I just be? Some stuff isn't working right. People pray. There's no answers. People believe God, and it falls flat. Society is falling apart at probably the greatest rate that I have ever seen, guys. We are one step away from anarchy. And the very ones that we put into power to hold the barbarians at bay, if you will, are the very ones that are accelerating us to the barbarians overrunning everything. And because we have allowed them to teach us and disenfranchise us from the way that our reality works or our universe works, we try to go through the motions and it never really works right. And we, we get frustrated. Sometimes we're told, you don't have enough faith. Well, maybe it's not that you don't have enough faith. You just don't have all the pieces of the puzzle together for faith to work. I want to get all the pieces back. Now, First Thessalonians. 1, or 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. And the very God of peace, or the very God of shalom, sanctify you wholly, separate you, separate you from darkness, separate you for his purposes. And I pray that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I love this next one. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. We are, we are made up of spirit, soul, and body. But not only are we made up of spirit, soul, and body, what we're going to find out this morning is when you put all the pieces together, the universe is made up of spirit, soul, and body. It functions within that dynamic. If it doesn't, God put us here to take dominion. And so we're spirit, soul, and body because to function in this universe, you have to have spirit, soul, and body. 
You have to function in all three to take dominion. You have to function in all three to move in authority. You have to have all three functioning and be cognizant of the fact that all three dimensions uh, involve everything, not just you. Now let's look at the Greco-Roman mindset at looking at spirit, soul, and body. And you'll see this almost in every theological work. You'll see this in counseling. And so what we have done is we have been very Greco-Roman. We separate it all out, and then we try to lap it all together. And see that itty-bitty dot right there in the middle of this little bitty place? They'll tell you that's where it all works. So you got all this stuff. It ain't really forming together, but it only connects right here. And it frustrates us. Because how many know that's less than, you know, they're talking about the 99 and the 1%. Right there's your 1% that works. And we look at that and it, we get frustrated at it. We, what's going on? Because that can be easily separated. So, you know, all this stuff up here is spiritual, but it has nothing to do with the soul and the body. And all this over here is of the soul and has nothing to do with the spirit and the body. And all this over here is just body and it has nothing to do with spirit or soul. If I had a dollar for every time I heard people tell me, you know, church is church and business is business, I'd have money. Because they're, they're very Greco-Roman. They try to separate it all out. That I can do all this stuff physically, and I can, I can fool myself into thinking it's not going to affect my soul or it's not going to affect my spirit. How many know that's a fool's errand? And so all this, all the understanding of this, this is a very Greco-Roman mindset of the tripartness of man. All it does is create frustration and you're being a pagan. Okay. Now, we need to understand that, how many know that our, that our Hebraic heritage, the Semitic understanding of things, is not a Western part of society, it is an Eastern part of society. It is Eastern in its concepts. That's why sometimes somebody from China may be closer to God than we are when they get a hold of, and let me tell you something right now, the Jewish roots are taking a hold of China by storm. I've got students over there. Not only do I have students over there, I've got a friend over there, Ariel Berkowitz, that is not only teaching when you get his, uh, he, he has written his own commentary through the Torahs and he has taught it on DVD. It is so popular in China that all you got to do is hit a button and it comes up in Mandarin across the bottom. The entire DVD sets. Because, it, I mean, it, because they, they understand it. It's of the same mindset. And so there was a guy named Watchman Nee. And in his book entitled The Spiritual Man, and if you don't like to read, don't grab it because it's about this thick. It makes War and Peace look like an essay. One of the things that he says, he said, that we had spirit, God's spirit breathed into human flesh, and when the two came together, there was, there was a bridge called the soul that formed between the two. And so that kind of sounds kind of logical until you start looking at God. How many know God's not just spirit? Grief is of the soul. Being pleased is of the soul. Getting angry is of the soul. Almighty God has a soul and he is spirit. So this is kind of close, and Brother, and brother Nee, when, as far as he could, at least he shift part of the body of Christ into something a little bit closer, but the Hebraic concept, it's one pie with three segments. Now, the only reason I didn't do it out in thirds is the program that I was doing this in wouldn't let me do that. It didn't have that choice. <laughs> but it's one pie. How I many know if you took your body away, you, quit, you wouldn't be here in this, in, in this universe? If you took your spirit away, you wouldn't be in this universe. If you took your soul away, well, Brother Mike, how can that happen? See, somebody catatomic, catatonic, all they do is sit there and drool. Their spirit's there, their body's there, but their soul's lost someplace. It's locked up behind something within their being. They cannot function in this universe. So everything in this universe, God created a spirit, soul, and body, first of all, because there's a, there is a tripartness that is echad, just like God. When you, when you look at the first line of the Shema, Shema Israel, Adonai, Elohenu, Adonai, Echad. Elohenu is a singular version of Elohim. 
So it says, Hero Israel, God, 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 is Ehad. Why? Every Jew knows about the Holy Spirit, knows about the Father. It's the one in the middle that's Eloheinu, Messiah. They can argue about, but if you do, you're still there's two witnesses pointing to the fact that he's one. The same way you can't really, when you get to heaven, whatever kind of physical body that we have for the, before the resurrection, I mean, in the spirit realm, it's more real than this realm. Well, it's interesting now within physics, they're saying that it appears with some data that's coming from the universe that this is a holographic simulation in the mind of God. Because he said light be, light is, holographic is, is light being manifested and becoming material. They've even discovered in the, in the, in the background radiation of the universe, there, there is self-correcting code. When stuff gets messed up in the display of the holographic universe, if you will, it self-corrects itself. That just shows you how awesome God is. But to, to function within this thing that we call reality, everything that you do must have a spiritual component, a component of your soul, and a component of your body. Otherwise, you cannot truly function function within the universe and get things to work right. Now, for all the, all the people that say, listen, you know, they're the soul and the spirit, they're sum, the synonymous, you know, tomato, tomato, potato, potato. The book of Hebrews says in Hebrews 4 and 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of asunder of soul and spirit. You see, sometimes from my, my own reason, I have a hard time separating what is soul and spirit, but the word of God can show us. But the word of God is even more powerful than that. It says of joint and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I mean, I, I like that the Word of God is, is that great. Guys, man was created to function in our universe, to take dominion, to move in kingdom authority, and to move in God's best. But man lost all this when he fell in the garden, and Jesus came to restore it. you believe that this morning? But we have been sold a bill of goods that robs us of moving in it properly because we do not realize that everything, and I mean everything, will have the spirit, soul, and body component to it. Everything. Anything that you do in life will have a spirit, soul, and body. I mean, doing this sermon and preparing this sermon this week it required my spirit, my soul, and my body to get it done. God, the Holy Spirit, spoke to my spirit. It bubbled up into my consciousness, out of my spirit, into my soul, and I had to sit there at a the computer and type it out. Then I had to get up here physically, and I'm allowing the anointing of the Holy Spirit to, to enable me to minister to you that which he spoke to me. I think it's interesting. Uh, guys, everything from handling your finances to even marital, marital intimacy has a spirit, soul, and body component to it. In fact, the Sanfords, which have done so much in the area of counseling deliverance, they have an entire book called Why Do Christians Commit Adultery? How many know that should be an oxymoron? But what happens when you have a relationship that in that time of intimacy, your spirits have got to connect, your souls have got to connect, and of course, your bodies have got to connect, okay? If you don't have all three and the spirits aren't connecting, you walk away from that intimacy wanting, and it opens the door for a Christian to commit adultery. But if, if in that marital relationship, you're connecting spirit, soul, and body, there's absolute satisfaction, there's absolute oneness there, and it becomes extremely hard for something to come in. Am I making sense this morning? How about this one, the power of the pen? The pen is spiritual, it is of the soul, and it's physical. Well, Mike, how can you say that? Because Second Peter one twenty one says, for, the, for the, the prophecy came not in old times by the will of man, but by holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You see, Peter, when he wrote this, was referring to guys like Isaiah and Nehemiah and Jeremiah. That the Holy Ghost moved on them. They spoke out a prophetic word, and it was written down. And when you open up and you turn to Isaiah, the same anointing that was on it 
when he spoke it forth is still on it today. And that spirit speaks to you and it will affect your soul. It will, it will connect with your emotions. It will connect with your mind. It will connect with your will. And it will cause your body to do things that are in line with God's word. All from a pen. I'm trying to get you to think this morning. I'm trying to get you to shift your paradigm just a little bit because all of us know that there has been something off. There's been something off. It's, it's like you're supposed to be running on 220, but you barely get it kicked up to 110. You're supposed to have a V8. And you have a four-cylinder with two spark plugs misfiring. I remember when Brother Rodhouse, one of his cars had that. And he, he said, Mike, he said, i got to turn off the air conditioner just to get up a hill. How many know that when he pulled his car into my garage and I put new spark plugs and new wires on it, he had a new car? He said, this thing can move. Why? All of it is functioning the way that it is supposed to function. But we're not functioning the way we're supposed to function because we don't add the dimension of spirit, soul, and body into what we do. But you know, some guys did it, didn't even walk with God. How many know the spirit of error moved on a guy named Adolf Hitler? And he picked up a pen and wrote Mein Kampf. He even did it from prison. He was almost like the devil's version of the Apostle Paul. He wrote Mein Kampf while in prison, and after he got released, he ended up being the chancellor of Germany and the Holocaust and World War II came up because this guy was moved by another spirit and it engaged his soul and he did something physically. Another one, Karl Marx, the Communist Manifesto. How many think that has done some damage to the world? There are a lot of guys right now in D.C. that that's their Bible. Sololinsky, the Handbook for Radicals. He knew by what spirit he was writing that for, and that basically is the handbook for our current president and most of his cabinet. And in the foreword to that book, he dedicates it to Lucifer who rebelled and at least got his own kingdom. How many know that he understood spirit, soul, and body? Oh, yeah. Guy named Aliester Crawley, one of the most evil men that ever lived, had a spirit come to him, and he channeled a book called The Book of the Law. Now, no Christian probably has read it, but all of them obey what it teaches. It says, do what you will, it's okay. Just do it in love. Do what thou will is the whole of the law. Do it in love. Love under law. That's an occultic concept. And we're using what a spirit told this man in the church today to do away with the law of God. James Bingingham, who is he? He used to be the, the, the head librarian of the Library of Congress. And many believe that he uh, was a, a basically a member of the Illuminati. And he wrote a book, Fire in the Minds of Men. How many know all these men wrote books that released the fire in the minds of men and it took them the other way because it wasn't the fire of heaven, it was the fire of hell? Every one of these guys understood the spirit, soul, and body connection. While they're telling us there is no spirit, there is no God, at the same time, what it allows you, if you just teach everybody it's the soul and it's just flesh, the physical world, what it allows them to do is they can go on and, and, and do things in the spirit that manipulate you because they have a greater control than you do because you take the spirit out of everything. Is that making sense? That's how they have gotten one up on us. That's why the, the Hebraic roots concept of understanding things are so valuable. It gets us from thinking like a pagan back into the mindset of what God gave us. And if we don't do that, we're in trouble. Now, I want to look at some spirit, soul, and body applications in the life of the believer. Prayer. If you begin looking at all the different scriptures, and I'm not going to do that this morning, but just sometime get out your, your Strong's Concordance, or if you have eSword, and this week we, we gave you a link to it, uh, from our website to additional resources like McClintock and Strong, and there's a lot of things there, guys. There are literally thousands of volumes of resources free that you can download on your computer. So, I mean, it, it's, it's a plethora 
I, I felt like I had, I had fa- found a gold mine, and the smallest chunk was 50 pounds when I found that this week. But to simply go and look at what the Hebrew and the Greek words mean. All of it, 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 in prayer, you've got to engage your spirit. You've got to flow with the Holy Spirit when you pray. You've got to engage your mind. You've got to focus. How I many know there's a place for emotions in prayer? There's a place for pacing in prayer. There's a place for clapping your hands in prayer. There's a place for falling down on your knees before God in prayer. All of this is involved in prayer. The Jewish people know that. Have you ever seen the guys going at the wailing wall and they're holding their prayer books, they're engaging their spirit, they're reading, they're engaging their soul, and what are they doing? They're engaging their bodies to help maintain the rhythm so that you can keep your focus because you have to engage your emotions and your will in what you pray and your body, otherwise you don't make the connection with heaven like you need to. How many of us have have experienced times and, and Mary and I, in the teaching on spiritual warfare, I, I've called it prophetic intercession repair. It's like the prophetic kicks in. And I mean, all of a sudden, you, it's like God kicked in the nitric oxide and your turbo booster kicks on. What really happens is your soul and your spirit and your body become one and become like a laser in that prayer. That's why half-hearted prayers don't work. Oh, Brother Mike, I'm going to try this. You ain't going to get it. <laughs> I remember back when years ago we, had, we were trying to minister to some people and, and it's like for the 500th time, get them to break generational curses. Well, Brother Mike, why didn't it work the first time? Because you didn't engage anything. You just went through the motions the first 499 times. We're hoping as we're convincing you and trying to get your emotions stirred up and to get your will in there that you can connect spirit, soul, and body and that faith can move in to where you can actually have what you believe. That's why sometimes it's important when you pray just to spend some time in worship to get the spirit going and and to get your mind focused. You can't pray distracted. You won't get anything. You can't pray half-hearted. You won't get anything. You can't pray double-minded. That means you can't be worried about the baseball game or the football game on TV and what you should be praying for. you got to be single-minded about it. And so unless you're, and all of us have different ways of doing it, but before you go into prayer, see to it that you engage your spirit, that you engage your soul, that you're focused. You may have to wide out what you're believing God for. That it's down in black and white that you've engaged your soul, then engage your body. Sometimes it's good just to, you know, one of the reasons I beat on the pulpit when I'm worshiping, not only does it sound good there and I just got to do it, that I'm, I'm trying to engage everything. So that I can release the power of God into this realm that the only way you can do it, everything in the kingdom of God is like a three-plong plug. How many have ever done stuff electronics and you didn't have one of the wires connected it don't work we went through life thinking that we were having the victory and every time our engine sputters and and spits and stalls out it's because you don't have all of it connected healing how does healing work the holy spirit will come upon a man's spirit that has a gift of healing, and anointing has to flow from the spirit into the flesh, and then he has to pray, which engage his soul. And what does the body tell us to do? To lay hands on the sick so that they would recover. It inquires all three. If you don't do that, you end up with empty hands on empty heads, and nothing happens. You've got to engage all three. Praise and worship. You know, it's very Hebraic if you look at the scriptures when it talks about praise and worship. They're very animated. Some scriptures, some of the words mean to fall down before God on your face. Some scriptures mean to jump up before God. Some scriptures mean to clap your hands. Some of the verses mean to run and spin. You see, before there was ever a Pentecostal getting wild in church, there was a Jew. Come on. King David, when they brought the Ark of the Covenant back into Israel, he jumped around so hard that all his clothes fell off and all he had on was his BVDs. How many know that's some hard preaching or some hard praising? 
Now, it used to be in, in, in the beginning of the Pentecostal movement, and it was way back when women all had their hairs all up with bobby pins and all that stuff, that there used to be kids assigned in those services after service just to go around and pick up all the bobby pins and try to give them back to sister so-and-so because she jumped around and praised and danced before God to all her bobby pins fell out, and there wasn't enough hairspray on this planet to hold all that bad boy into place. And you hear about miracles because they engage themselves, spirit, soul, and body, when they praise God. When you do that and you plug in, stuff happens to you. Guys, there have been times that I've come up and I've come to our services, and the last thing I wanted to do was praise because I didn't feel good. I had a rough week. Or I was hurt, and you know how many times that I was hurt, and I stood here, and you, you, you think you guys stand long during our praise and worship. I start standing about 9 o'clock in the morning because we have rehearsal, then we have prayer before church, and then we have our church. And how many know I'm still standing now? You all are sitting back there relaxed in your lazy boys, and I'm still up here because I want to engage everything that I have in facilitating God's work. And so when we praise and worship, you got to have all three engaged before you really connect with heaven. How about faith? Ah. Faith starts in your spirit. It progresses through your soul. In other words, it starts in your spirit, and the Holy Spirit convinces your soul that something of the Word of God is true, and it always sparks an action. One of the problems that James had with the Greeks and the Romans, they said, I'll show you my faith. What are you doing? Having faith. That that nice Jewish boy looked at him and said, no, you're not. If you believed, you'd have moved. It would have sparked an action. So much so that in James 2, 18 through 19, yea, a man may say, he hath faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Believest thou that there is a God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So if all you do is sit there and say you believe and it never sparks an action, you're just like a devil. Uh Uh-oh. You can sit there and tremble, that's all you do. (laughs) Ah! But what thou, O man, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. Starts in the spirit, moves through the soul, and creates a physical reaction. It's like you take nitro and glycerin, and then you shake vigorously. (laughs) Because you want to get to the explosion. You know, if you start blowing up and having Holy Ghost explosions in the devil's face, maybe he'll quit getting in your face so much. One of, one of my favorite stories in the life of Jesus, and you think, well, it was when he raised Lazarus from the dead. No, no, no. It's when he went out to the wilderness for 40 days, and afterward, there's this little scripture that said, and the devil left him for a season. The devil said, I can't take any more of this. I've got to leave him for a season. You see, even though Jesus had angels come to minister to him, the devil went away licking his wounds, and he had to wait for them to heal and devise another way of getting to Jesus. Now, have you ever caused the devil to leave you for a season because it was too hard for him to stay, and he had to back away from you and say, I think I better rethink this? Probably not. Jesus did, and he did it all by just simply quoting the word. His spirit was filled with the word. His mind, his soul was filled with the word. He refused the easy way. He refused fame and fortune. He refused to even prove himself. Now, here's something just in the natural that I found out. If you know who you really are, you don't have to prove it to anybody. It's the guy that don't know who he is who's trying to prove it to everybody because what he's trying to do is prove it to himself. It's like the little dog always wants to fight. Nobody's ever seen a chihuahua with an attitude. He'll say, I'm big on the inside. I'm big on the inside. I'm big on the inside. You take a big old pit bull or Doberman, he just sits there and goes, that's your only warning, dude. That's right. Because he knows he's big. (laughs) 
Let me tell you something. When you learn how to walk with God and you have engaged your spirit, you gave age your soul, and you're engaging your body, the devil comes to you and you don't have to go, yip, 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 yip. I bind you, I bind you, I bind you, I bind you in the name of Jesus. Blah, 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 blah. You just sit there and go, <laughs> go ahead, make my day. I'm about to get a testimony. I'm about to get a testimony that I'm going to share with other people. Not only am I going to watch God drive you out of my life and God turn this situation around for good, but I'm going to start encouraging others to do it. And I'm going to share with them what I did because I know who I am in Christ. I know that I've got to engage myself. You see, what the devil tries to do, he tries to get you to engage everything with your soul and let your spirit man go to sleep. The problem with a lot of the body of Christ is we, we have... We have so overemphasized our intellectualism that we've not developed ourselves spiritually. And I don't see anywhere in the Word of God that says, Blessed are the eggheads, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. And you're speaking to a former egghead because I have learned I have got to, I have got to build up my spirit so that my spirit and my soul are balanced. And I found some people that exercise their spirit all the time, but they never do anything with building up their soul. And you can't, they can't keep balance because they keep slipping off into mysticism because it's the Word of God that keeps you in balance. I don't need to study, Brother Mike. I got the Holy Ghost. Well, Jesus said the Holy Ghost would put you in remembrance. Well, let's just get into basic English. You can't remember what you've never read. <laughs> Come on now. You can't remember what you've never heard. And all these people walk around with, with their, oh, oh, I'm perceiving something. I hear something. Yeah, I do too, my belly ground, but that doesn't mean it's time for a banquet. It's got to balance out. Spirit, soul, and body have got to balance out. And if I constantly engage, every time I pray, I'm exercising both. If you have the gift of tongues, pray in the Spirit. Reading the Word of God not only lines out your soul, it feeds your spirit man. Doing the Word brings all three. Purposely, consciously doing it. Look for a place this week to do something out of the Word. To do something that you act out of your spirit, you engage your soul, say, this is what God's word says. Now, Holy Spirit, anoint me to do it. Let me do it out of my spirit. And as a choice, as a part of my will, I choose to do the word and then go physically do something. If you learn how to do that, you may spit and sputter for a while because you're trying to kickstart and get it all for the baby for the first time in your life, yeah. moving right. Yeah. But when you do, it begins coming together for you in your life. You see, the truth is, the spirit of error has been caught. Your teachers in school lied to you that everything was of the soul and everything was of the flesh. In university, they lied to you. And the very ones that did it didn't even believe it. Here's one thing, I, and this is to kind of show you the way that they do. How many know everybody is goofy on evolution? Although I do see some people in power that I think may be devolving, but let's just put that on. So you can just be falling into darkness, okay? Did you know the elite don't believe in evolution? That is a smokescreen that they have sold everybody to keep them from the truth. They believe in reincarnation. And they keep reincarnating until they can get the earth to the place. You understand the, the, uh, the occultic wheel and the occultic holidays, all these different things. It's a wheel. It's called the cycle of life. Anybody ever heard that term? Okay, if you do it right, you come back, you're a little bit more on the peg. You come back, you're a little bit more on the peg. If you do it wrong, you end up being a gopher when you come back. You know, just over and over and over again. And they said it will be that way until they can create an atmosphere on this planet that the great despot can come who actually gives them the rest of the secret sauce and how to become a god. They call the Antichrist. They don't believe it, but they sell all this to you so that they can sell you that you're nothing but a, an, an, an a evolved animal. And so they tell the world, you know, sex is just a sexual instinct. Just go out and give in to your instinct, whatever it is. Just give in to it. You're nothing more than an animal. 
And see, if you're nothing more than an animal, then you can take a group of people and you can tattoo numbers on them and start systematically exterminating because all you're doing is culling the herd. It's a lie. There is a spiritual aspect of you that animals do not have. You're created in the image of God. That life in mankind is precious. It is unique in all the universe. You bring it back in line. We got to get rid of their lies. And you guys got to choose. I'm going to fun function this week, spirit, soul, and body. I'm going to look that where I can engage all three in everything that I do. If you do that in your prayer life, you're going to start seeing things happening. That's right. Yep, that's right. Now, I did this week with, with Michael when he needed to get his vehicle. God said, told me, he said, you go over there and you take them and you just wait. So I just went over there and a lot of times he'll tell you, I just went and sat in the truck. What would you do? Well, I kept up on my email, then I prayed in between and stuff. The presence of God that I brought to that place set everything up where everything functioned the way it would, and so the devil couldn't get into it. And see, if you learn how to engage spirit, soul, and body, you create an atmosphere of heaven around you where the devil can't get stuff done, but you take out the spirit aspect of it, and he can get anything done underneath your nose. Am I making sense this morning? We have got to develop a kingdom paradigm on how our universe works. When you do, you can get the universe to work in your behalf. You can begin flowing in the things of the kingdom of God. Come on now. I'm ready to start seeing some people healed. I'm, ready, I'm, I'm wanting to see some stuff turn around. But the only way that we can do it is as a, as a congregation, as a people. If we start flowing in this, no matter what happens in the world and how dark the world gets, my Bible says that when that happens, our light comes. When gross darkness covers the earth like the earth has never seen before, God says to his people, your light has come, therefore shine. You can't shine when you've been fooled by the world on the how to not properly function within this world. But when you do, well, Brother Michael, you tell me that when I, can, when I can move like this, if the devil comes after me, that I can dodge bullets? No, I'm telling you, you won't have to. There he goes, quoting the Matrix. Had to, had to relate to this generation. How many times that God has saved us? Mary and I shouldn't be here many times over. How many times God has saved us? I want to see some more of that, not only in our lives. I want to see it in your lives. I'm wanting to see, guys. But you know what would be my greatest joy is, Mike, you don't have time to preach today because we, we're having a testimony service and we're sharing so much of what God is doing. It has spilled over. It's 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and we're kind of getting hungry, so maybe you get a chance to preach next week. That would be one of the happiest services I have ever had. Because God is moving and functioning, and we're seeing Jesus is alive and that his word works, that his commandments are real. Not only his commandments are real, but his promises are real because they're always connected to the commandments. Do the commandments, you get the promise. Mm. You got to do the commandments, spirit, soul, and body. Not just soul and body, or not just body, spirit, soul, and body. Function under the unction of the Holy Ghost. Well, Father, I thank you this morning. Father, I ask more than anything that you have done a shift in our paradigm of the universe that we live in. Father, my greatest desire is for us to move in kingdom. Father, to see our prayers answered. Father, to see faith move. To see us grow in you. To see us engaged, really, in all of life so that we can approach our worship of you, our time in the word, Father, our time with friends and family, our, even our, our time with our, with our mates, Father. That's right. That's right. Yep. Father, to where it's spirit, soul, and body, that it can be all yes. that you have created for it yes. to be. Yes. Father, our desire is to walk in your best. And Father, teach us, Holy Ghost. Teach us, Spirit of God, Spirit of truth, come. And teach us how to function, spirit, soul, and body, in all that we do. Open our eyes that we may see, and that we can function in your kingdom in the right ways, we ask. In Jesus' name.